Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on Power Automate, formerly known as Flow versus Azure Logic Apps. My name is Peter Carson. I'm going to be your presenter here today and uh, president of Extranet User Manager, as well as an Office Apps and Services MVP. Uh, my contact details are up on here for email and Twitter. Also, the president of the local Toronto SharePoint Users Group. Now, we're going to be sharing this deck and the recording afterwards, so all the links and all the details that you get in through here, you'll have access through from our site. Um, also on the line, we've got Logan Guest, who's in charge of sales. So if you like what you see here, um, certainly you can make use of it yourself, but if you're looking for some help from us, happy to provide that as well. A uh, quick agenda of what we're going to be going over here. Uh, we're going to start with an overview of uh, both Power Automate and Logic Apps. Just kind of level set people so they understand what the two products are, how they relate to each other, and how that works. We're going to get into licensing. Um, always a tricky topic with Microsoft. They don't make it simple, but we'll do our best to simplify that and organize that for you. Uh, and then we'll take you through some customer scenarios. I think the best way to really understand what we've got going on here is to, uh, to actually look at real world examples as part of that. Um, part of that, we'll get into some approvals with adaptive cards and some custom connectors if we have time near the end of the session. Now, just a heads up, I realize I messed up as I went through here and I didn't increase our GoToWebinar. This has been a really popular topic and we're closer to 200 people registered and we've got 101 max in the uh, in the session here. If we bump up against the, the 100 mark, which are about two thirds of the way there, um, apologies, I'm gonna stop the webinar and restart it. We've already changed our account, but unfortunately we have to restart the uh, the webinar for that to take effect. We'll, so we'll see how uh, how the numbers go from that point of view. But before we get in there, what I'd like to do is do a, uh, a quick poll just to get a sense of who's in the, the webinar and kind of what your background is. So let me share this out and get a sense of you know who's using Office 65 today, um, how about Power, Power Automate or Flow, uh, Power Apps, which we're going to touch on here today, and Azure Logic Apps. You can choose uh, any number, one through all four, depending on how that works for you. Did I launch that out? I did not. There we go. Sorry. Makes it a little easier for you to respond if I actually launch it. So I'll give you a minute to respond to that, and then I'll share the results of that back with the group. Okay, we've got almost everybody voted there. Let me uh, just go ahead and close that and share that back out. So not surprising, almost everybody um, is in on Office 365, uh, quite a large amount on Power Automate and, and to a certain degree Power Apps, not very many on the Logic Apps side though. So um, hopefully you'll learn something new here today and understand you know, how, how can you leverage Power Automate versus Logic Apps and what that looks like. So let me go ahead and hide that. Let's start with a little background on the, uh, the Power Platform side. So the, the name of Flow changed back in the fall to Power Automate, and that was really to align to the product family that it was already a member of, which is Microsoft Power Platform. It's part of the Dynamics 365 group, um, and it's really uh, a wrapper around Power Apps, which is the, the forms development and application development side of things. Power Automate, anytime you build a form, there's usually a workflow that goes with that and Power BI from a dashboard and uh, analytics point of view. I mentioned that's part of the Dynamics 365 side. Uh, there is licensing through Office 365 as well, and you can also use it just from a standalone application point of view as well. There is uh, a very rich data connector ecosystem that we're going to talk about, so it doesn't need to be a Microsoft-only solution. There's literally hundreds of connectors going to lots of different third-party, even competitive solutions out there. One of our customer case studies is going to be with Salesforce, uh, so that's an interesting scenario there as well. And then, of course, Azure being the underlying platform underneath a lot of this. So diving a little deeper into Power Automate, um, it is a way to create automated workflows. Um, as I mentioned, it can be a wide variety of different applications and services. You could literally have a, 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 Power, app or a, a Power Automate that triggers off of somebody tweeting something, and maybe it records it to your website, sends you an email, puts it into SharePoint, records it in Salesforce. You, know, you can literally wire all those different disparate systems together with Power Automate. So it's quite... Uh, quite sophisticated and quite, quite extensible from that point of view. It supports both, supports both Microsoft and third-party apps, and you can actually build your own uh, custom connectors to, cut, to connect to any system, whether it's your own line of business system or maybe a third-party system that doesn't have an out-of-the-box connector for it already. Links on each of these slides go to the detail pages, so as, as I mentioned, we'll share the slides out. Uh, you can dive down into more details from there. 
Now, uh, the audience as a whole not as familiar with Azure Logic Caps. It's actually the platform underneath Power Automate. So when you're using Power Automate, you're actually using Azure Logic Caps. And I'll show you when we get into the designer side of things, it's actually the exact same designer when you're working with Azure, Azure Logic Caps versus Power Automate. There are slight different uh, actions and, and features between them. You know, one of the, the things is the approvals in Logic Apps are fairly simple. They're a little more sophisticated on the Power Automate side. And our last customer scenario, we're actually gonna show how we, we expand beyond that in Logic Apps and, and build that out. There's integration into Visual Studio as part of that as well. So it, it is more developer focused, but it's still something that potentially a citizen developer can use from that point of view. So if we compare and contrast between Power Automate and Logic Apps, so this concept of citizen developer is, is a name that Microsoft came out with. I mean, the Power part of the Power Platform name was really targeted towards Power users. This idea that you know a sophisticated user who's not a developer, is not an IT um, staff member, can build their own applications in Power App and build their own workflows around that in, in Power Automate. The reality is Power Apps, which we'll touch on, is maybe a little too complicated for most Power users to use. And they've coined the term citizen developer, saying, hey, you don't need to be a full hardcore developer uh, to use Power Apps, but probably more than a, a typical Power user. On the Power Automate side, I would argue that you know a, a Power user is, is absolutely appropriate for, for using Power Automate. It is very easy to use. Um, if, you, if you leverage the standard connectors and you're doing things in Office 365, which will be our first focus, you know it's really easy to use that. There are premium customer connectors, but that does get us into premium licensing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Switching on to the Logic App side, uh, we've got the the Azure portal and Visual Studio. You know that can be a little daunting, overwhelming for for a power user. Never mind the fact that IT may not want to grant access into the Azure portal for um, for a power user from that point of view. So that can be a barrier for a lot of people from a Logic Apps point of view. The reality is, you use the same designer, the same connectors, even custom connectors that you build for Power Automate. You can use in Logic Apps. In fact, you can export from Power Automate into Logic Apps or vice versa. So you can actually move back and forth quite easily between the two. So if we look at the, the licensing for Power Automate, and, and as I mentioned, Microsoft doesn't make this easy. I've got links on the next slide to, uh, to both a, a FAQ as well as a deeper licensing guide for that. Uh, but there's basically a number of plans that Power Automate comes as part of, and then you can license it directly itself. So if you've got Office 65, which most people on the call have, you actually have uh, the standard Office 65 connectors included as part of that plan. And there's a ratio between the numbers of users you have in Office 65 and how many runs of a workflow you can do in Power Automate. Basically, 700 times the number of users per month is how many times you can run a workflow. So if you've got 1,000 people in your organization licensed for Office 65, you could run any number of uh, flow workflows as long as the total number of runs was less than 700,000 per month, which is a big number. If you need more than that, you can buy more uh, from that point of view. If you have Dynamics 365 licensing, that even opens up more. Um, it goes beyond just the standard Office 65 connectors and basically gives you access to, to all the standard and premium connectors. So you don't need any additional licensing if you have Dynamics 365. Now, if only part of your organization is licensed for Dynamics 365, that's where it gets a little trickier. Um, likewise, if you're using Power Apps to build applications and you want to use Power Automate to build workflows behind those apps, as long as those workflows are related to that application, you can create as many workflows as you want as part of that, and, and that's all licensed as part of your Power Apps license. Now, if none of those apply, um, you know, maybe you, you want to go outside of Office 365, use premium connectors, but you don't have Dynamics 365 um, or Power Apps, then you can either license per user or per workflow. What that means in that thousand user example, you know, if you wanted them to be able to run an unlimited number of different workflows, um, it would be $15 per user per month. Now that could be a, a significant dollar. I mean, that's $15,000 per month. You have to look at what's the, the break even from that point of view. If you don't have a lot of different workflows, it might be more cost effective to say, you know what, we're going to license it per flow, which is only $100 per flow. So let's say you only had five different flows. The minimum number you can purchase this way is five. So that would be $500 a month. So that's significantly cheaper than the 15,000. But it depends. I mean, if you're only 20 people in your organization, um, you know, the $300 a month might be better from a, a per user plan. So you have to look at your own scenario, um, how you're planning on using flow and what sort of connections you're going to make from it to determine what makes the most sense from a, a licensing point of view. 
Now, they, they did change the licensing a fair bit last year. The last changes were in October of 2019. And at that point, anything that you do against SQL, against Azure, against Dynamics 365, as well as lots of other things are now considered premium connectors. Any custom connectors you build are premium. Um, and this multiplexing concept, it's hard for me to explain quickly here. It's, it goes into a fair bit of detail in the licensing guide linked below. But basically the idea is if I benefit from a, a flow workflow, even if I don't directly interact with it, I need to be licensed for it. So if, if we've got, say, a, a SharePoint Framework web part that I'll show you for requesting a new team, you know, and it writes something to a list and, and that causes the workflow to happen and I get a new Microsoft team spun up as part of that, I didn't touch the flow workflow myself when I requested that team, but I benefited from it. I need to be licensed for it. So it's a pretty broad net. So you really have to be careful and think about that from that point of view. It's going to be tough for Microsoft from a, a software audit and, uh, and enforcement point of view as to how you actually account for that. Uh, but that's really the spirit of the licensing there. So switching gears, talking about logic apps, um, they're actually a fair bit simpler. So most things in Azure are consumption-based. You pay for what you use, and logic apps is the, the same example there. And basically, you, you pay for each action. And I'll explain in a minute what those are as we get into the designer view in, in logic apps. But basically, each step in your workflow is an action. And, and each time that runs, it's metered, and you, and you pay for those executions. Now, they're tiny, tiny dollars. I've actually put the commas in after the decimal point just to give you a better sense of, of where the scale is. So each of the actions in your workflow consume 32 millionths of a dollar per execution. So you need a lot of them to, to add up to significant dollars. It goes up an order of magnitude when you start calling connectors and then another order of magnitude, just over a tenth of a cent per execution for enterprise connectors. So if we take an example, I'm going to be showing you our, our Teams provisioning open source solution that we have for people requesting Teams and SharePoint sites and things like that. You know, in a typical um, run through that workflow, I've just illustrated down below, we run nine actions. We have four standard connectors when we you know, interact with SharePoint or send emails through Outlook. Those are standard connectors. And we have one enterprise connector when we call it to Azure Automation to actually do the heavy lifting and, and build out that team and that SharePoint site. So grand total is we're a little over two tenths of a cent for each run through there. So if we wanted to use the the flow licensing scenario of $100 a month per workflow, I mean, it would take 45,000 runs a month of this workflow to consume that $100. Typically, you're not going to create 45,000 teams every month. That would be kind of an unmanageable um, organizational structure. So again, you have to look at what makes sense for your organization. And what we find, you know, this team's provisioning in particular has become really popular. We're doing a lot of deployments with this and the clients may not be using Flow at all. It actually makes sense to, to use Logic Apps for it. So we've structured this particular workflow using Logic Apps. And I'm going to take that, you through that as our scenario two as we go through the different scenarios here. So I'd like to, to make it real. So we're actually going to use one of our real examples. The client here is Community Living Toronto. They're a not-for-profit organization that provides uh, community outreach services to, to underprivileged in the city of Toronto. And you know their staff, as they're, they're working, they need various different things. So we've um, piloted this out from a finance help system point of view to say, hey, when there's P-cards, so expense credit cards that are required by staff, typically in the past, there's being a paper form that they fill out and it literally goes across different people's desks and ends up at the finance department to, to do the final approval and actually um, create that request for the, the P card and provide it to the employee. Likewise, from a petty cash point of view. So we wanted to automate that, build a, an electronic form for that and build a workflow process around it. So we're gonna to touch on both Power Apps and um, Power Automate as part of this scenario here. And there's some reporting requirements. We wanna have some roll up around that. Now, we wanted to keep it within the standard Office 365 licensing. So when you build a Power App, you can, you can build it in two different ways. You can publish it as part of a SharePoint list, or you can build it as a standalone app. We wanted to keep it within the Office 365 world, so we just use standard connectors in it when we publish it as part of the, the SharePoint list. Likewise, on the Power Automate side, we didn't want to stray away from standard there, um, so it only uses standard connectors. Now there were business requirements. There was certain information we needed to extract from their Active Directory, uh, from their HRIS system. Um, and we didn't want to build custom connectors or use any sort of enterprise connectors that would drive the licensing costs up on this. So what we did is we actually built a, a scheduled PowerShell script that basically collects that information and puts it into SharePoint in a secure spot uh, that, the, that both the Power Apps and the Power Automate can then easily access and make use of from that. So they're not directly using any of those enterprise features. This is not a multiplexing scenario because we're not 
layering on top of, we're doing some work behind to prepare and get ready for both the Power Apps and the Power Automate. So it's totally cool from a licensing point of view. Um, and it does highlight a very important fact that a lot of these types of applications, particularly employee self-service, um, security is often something that's overlooked as part of that. So let's have a, actually have a look at the, um, the information architecture for this and get a sense of how we've managed that security. So we basically have three spots in SharePoint that's managing this process. So the, the first spot in the center is actually the submissions list. And, and this is a, a simple list that have content types for the different types of forms that are gonna get filled out. And it's a spot for, for people to submit that form. And we've set the security up that everybody only sees their own submissions in there. Uh, they can't see anybody else's. And those submissions actually only live there for a brief period of time. There's two workflows. The first one actually just moves it from that list and put it in the request list. And then request list, we have actually have folders set up for each user and we set permissions up in there so that each user has access to their own folder. And then each of their managers, as you go up the, the reporting food chain in, in Active Directory, has access to their subordinates folders as well. So you can see your own stuff and you can also see any stuff that you potentially are gonna be approving or reviewing as part of that. And then finance has access to all of that because they need to be able to look across all of them. So that's the form side of it. And then the bottom section, the employee data, that's actually just a document library. And this is where we keep the, the actual user data. So things like the, the employee number, who your manager is, what department you belong to, all that kind of background information that both the form and the workflow is gonna need. Um, we actually create what's called a JSON file, basically a, a structured data file in that folder for each user. And we update that each night through a, a scripted process. And then it's very easy for our, our Power App and our Flow to access that and make the decisions it needs to do from a business point of view. And we've applied the same security. So again, you only see your own plus your subordinates user folders in there. This is a nice model. Actually, when we get to the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about you know, thoughts and ideas for future topics. This is one I'd actually like to dive deeper into from a technical point of view as a, as a deep dive session. So I'll throw that out later. Um, got some screenshots in here just for the, the PowerPoint deck. But what I think is more useful is let's actually take you through a live demo of what this looks like. So let me flip over to one of my other browsers here. OK. So this is the, the development environment for Community Living Toronto. Um, we're not gonna go into it too much today, but we're a strong proponent of having um, at least development and production, if not a test environment in between, um, and having sort of separate Office 65 tenants, separate uh, Power Automate flow tenants as part of that. So you've got a, a place to work as developers, a place to QA from a test point of view, and then your production area uh, to, to do things for real from there. So this is the, the dev area it's, it's good for playing with from that point of view. So we've got a number of different request forms in here. Um, I'm going to use the, the PCARD new request. So I'm an employee. I'd like a new PCARD. Um, I want to fill out the request for this. So I click on it, and it's flipped me over to Power Apps. Um, so we've built a Power App form on here to capture the information that we need here. Um, I'm just going to put in some sample data here. Let's say I want a $1,000 PCARD. I'll leave the comments and request date blank from there. I don't need to fill out my information because this, um, this form already captures who I am signed in and records that in there. So later the workflow will know exactly who made this request and what needs to happen with it from there. So I go ahead and hit next. I need to accept the PCARD policy and the purchasing policy. Um, I will scan and read those like everybody does. Click the accept on them and I can now submit my request. So if we come back here, um, if I dig under the hood and look at my site contents, I'm not actually going to see that submissions folder. We hit it so that people wouldn't normally see it. Now, security by obscurity is generally a bad idea, but remember, it's just a temporary spot. I could only see my own items for a short period of time, even if I could find it through there. But let's actually flip over to the Power Automate side of things. So we've got two flow workflows that we want to run. I'm going to come into the first one, which basically takes the items from that submission list and put it into the request list in the right folder for the user. Now, before I start anything else, I'm actually going to hit the test button here. Um, basically, the way Power Automate works is it pulls periodically against SharePoint to see when new items are created or modified, which is the, the action that we want there. I want to kick that and make that happen a little faster so we don't have to wait from a demo point of view. So it's actually gone through that process now. And if I open this up, I can actually see, you know, here's that Peter test 0225-3 that I just submitted to the list. Um, so the nice thing is I can actually see the details 
of, of what happened in that workflow. So let me come back in there and walk you through those steps. So it triggers when there's a new item in there. I initialize some variables. I get some, uh, some details about that particular item or sorry, not about that item, about the employees that I know what folder I need to put them into from there. Um, and then basically down here, you know, I made it to create a new folder to, to put that item into in the other list um, and basically move that list item over. So basically what that's done is taken that out of this submissions list and put it in the right users folder here. So only the right people have access to it and we've got the security implemented properly from there. So that's flow workflow number one. Now it's in the right spot. We want to do the actual uh, request approval. This is where the magic happens in terms of going through the actual approvals. And it, we can see that it has already started. So it's running there. It started about a minute ago. So let's look at that particular one there and see what it's doing. So it, it basically kicked off when something got created in this request list here through the action of moving it across. Again, we've got some variables that we're going to be using through there. We're getting some employee data through here. We're parsing that employee data to understand what we need to do from an approvals point of view. And basically, we've gotten to an approval step here. So we're waiting for the immediate supervisor. So we're looking at that data that we capture from an employee point of view, and that tells us who this person's immediate supervisor is, and we've sent that person an email for approval. Now we're in a dev environment, so I'm going to be wearing all the different hats. So if I go over to my email here, I'll see here's the actual request for approval. So these are the out-of-the-box approval emails that come from Flow. They're actually quite nice. You know, you can you can manage the whole um, content in here, so I can actually provide right in the body all the details that somebody needs to to make a decision on this, whether they're going to approve and reject it. Um, this is called a, an Outlook actionable message. And the reason for that name is you see right here in Outlook, I've got all, not only all the details about the approval that I need to decide, but I've got the actions here too. So I can click on the approve. I can put in a reason if I want to and go ahead and submit it. And you'll see Outlook is smart. It actually updates in place that email that we got to show me that it's approved. So if I come back later into my inbox, I'm not confused as to did I approve this or not. It actually shows me right through here. So now if I come back to my run history, we can see you know, live that's gone to a green check mark. We're actually into the next step through here. So it went to the immediate supervisor, but now it's going over to finance. Saying finance needs to approve that. So I come back to my email. Um, we're, we're pretty chatty on emails. We send one back to the requester to say, hey, it's been approved by management. Um, it's not all the way through the process. And then here's the approval to the finance team. Looks very much like the other one, just in terms of who it's targeted to. So let's go ahead and go the through the approval on that one as well. We come back to our run history. I love this live debugging. You can see the green check marks come up right as we go through. It's gone down to, to finance response. It's sent an email out to the employee to say it's approved. And it's actually created a task, which is very much like an approval. Um, what this is, is there's somebody in the finance team who's responsible for actually going into the PCARD system from a banking point of view and processing that request. And footprint is the, uh, it's the actual system that manages that. So it's actually sending an email over there to, to put the request in there. Um, and then it's saying here, once you've done that task of, of updating that out of the system so that the actual P card is going to get created, just mark it as task completed. It's not a approve reject. It's just saying, yes, I've done this work item from a task management point of view. And now we can see it's actually being processed by the expense administrator. So if we come back to our, our flow workflow, it's actually gone all the way through to the end there. So you know we can build out fairly sophisticated steps. We're using um, Active Directory management structure to understand who the supervisors are, who that needs to get routed to from that point of view. Um, on the uh, the petty cash one, we've got some different rules in there depending on your job role. You know if you're already a supervisor, petty cash request doesn't need to be approved. It just goes straight to finance. So you can build that sort of logic into your workflow as well and get some quite sophisticated from there. So that's customer scenario number one. Now, we actually um, are also working with Community Living Haldeman, which is a, a related organization, different geographical area. Um, and they were very keen to use Microsoft Forms rather than Power Apps because it's an easier tool for building your, your front end forms on there. So just for the heck of it, I decided, you know what, let's build this PCARD request form on a Microsoft form site. And it literally took me about five minutes this morning to, to build this out. I haven't actually played with it. There's zero responses, but it'll give you a quick sense. 
So when we're building a, a, a form in Microsoft Forms, you know, here I've got the same request for credit limit. In fact, let's put it into preview mode. And this is what it would look like when somebody was actually filling out the form. So I've got my credit limit, my comments, my policies, which I need to accept, my purchasing policy that I need to accept, and then I can go ahead and submit that form. So it's a very easy way to, to create a, a submit only type of form. It doesn't really work if you need to come back to the form, um, sort of next step in the process or to add some more information in. That's probably where Power Apps makes a lot of sense. But in this example, we don't need to do that. We just need to capture the initial request and record it into SharePoint. Now, when I fill this out, let's actually go through that. We'll do a live demo here and we'll say, okay, um, if I do a share here and I copy this link, this is what you would actually point people to off of your, your homepage in SharePoint to say, hey, this is your form. Let's go ahead and fill it out. We'll do the $1,000 request, put some comments in there. We'll say yes. Now, if I say no on here and I submit it, it's still going to submit. So that's something you're going to need to check on the workflow to say, hey, you, you didn't say yes. So I'm not going to process your request. You need to fill out a new request. And basically, your response is now being submitted. So if I come back to forms here and I look at responses, I can live see the responses that came back through there. In fact, it will create me nice charts and such from there. What you can do with Power Automate, and I haven't done it here just yet, uh, there's actually great templates in here. So if I come in here and say, hey, you know, I'm in my flows and I want to create a new flow from a template, and, and we live did this in a session with Community Living Haldeman uh, last week as we went through this. We said, okay, well, I know I want to use Forms and I want to use SharePoint. So let's just search the template. There's tons of templates there. So here's one here that says, hey, when somebody uh, responds in form, record that response in SharePoint. But look, right beside it, it does the same thing, but it actually has an approval step. Well, that's kind of what I wanted. So I can actually pick that template. It'll say, I'm going to be using forms, SharePoint approvals, um, Outlook. Yeah, go ahead and continue. And it'll actually build me the starting version of that flow. And we actually built one. I've got it in another tenant here. We tweaked things around a little bit, basically went through that approval process. And we can actually use a SharePoint list to record those results and build a dashboard through that. Because that's one of the things that Community Living Toronto wanted was you know a bit of a dashboard here where I can switch over and say, hey, I want to look at all requests, for example. Um, and I can see my completed request in there. Actually, let me just refresh that. Go to all requests again. There's the 25-3, uh, the one that I just completed. And you could build different views that show, you know, basically work buckets to say what's pending management approval, what's pending finance approval, what's being processed by finance. So you can start to build a nice dashboard around these processes just through different views on SharePoint. So very powerful. Um, and, and with a little bit of base work, building those folders and those scripts to populate the employee data, once you've done that once, you can actually bang out lots of different these style of these employee self-service forms. And, and it's something that potentially somebody in HR, somebody in finance could build those Microsoft forms and those Power Automate flows themselves. So this is where we really get into that power user scenario there. So let's come back to our deck. So that was our first scenario. Customer scenario number two, um, it's actually for a, a consulting company, not us, um, it's, it's one of our clients, decided not to be named, that's okay. And it's basically built off of our team and site provisioning open source solution. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna take you through the out of the box, and then I'm gonna describe how we've enhanced that for this particular scenario. So let's flip over to browser B here. And this is our demo tenant that we use for a number of things, including our site provisioning. So for those of you that are not familiar with this, I did a webinar in January on this topic. We're thinking of repeating it in April. It's a very popular topic for us right now. It's around Teams and, and SharePoint governance and even rolling OneNote, Planner, potentially streams into that as well to say, okay, as you're requesting these resources, can we put some structure around that? Not just from an approvals point of view to make sure that they're only being created when appropriate, but also to build them in a consistent way that every team has the right tab set up, things are well organized so that people can be effective as they switch between different teams and different SharePoint sites. So this is a communication site. It's a great spot to explain what Microsoft Teams is, provide some adoption resources and such. But let's drill right down into the request a team. Now we're not using forms or Power Apps for this. We're actually using a SharePoint framework web part that we've built as part of the open source solution. So it's freely available up on GitHub. The first thing that it wants to know is, well, what division are you requesting this team or this site for? 
I've got a couple sample ones in here. I'm going to use the temporary demos with approval because I want to take you through the actual approval process. And then based on that division, what are the templates that we have? I'm going to choose the simplest one, which is a modern communication site. As I choose different templates, if I go to the UM group site, you'll see we have lots of different choices that pop up here. So the information that we collect is dependent on the template that we use. Uh, now, communication sites don't have teams associated with them. They don't have groups. They still get a OneNote, uh, but we're going to turn the OneNote off, and we don't actually want to create a plan. I want to keep this as simple as possible for right now. Um, let's go ahead and submit that. Oh, wait, I need to actually type something in there. And we auto check to make sure that that URL is available and, and everything's good to go from that point of view. So I'll go ahead and submit that. And all this has done under the hood is actually written that request into a sites list as a new request. So it's kind of similar to the one we just showed you where um, you know we've got a form that writes into a SharePoint list and we can see here's our new request that I just put in with all the details. No, I'm not gonna create a OneNote or a planner or a team. It's not a public group. Here's the URL. It's everything we need to, to run this process through. Now, in this scenario, we're going to be using a couple of external things. We're going to be using Azure Automation to actually create the sites. That gets us into premium territory. So this was a decision point to say, you know what, instead of using Power Automate, let's flip this over to Logic Apps. It actually started as a flow workflow, and we were actually able to export that, import it into Logic Apps, and then flesh out um, that, that workflow in Logic Apps. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So first off, let's come to our runs history. Let's see if that new one's there yet. No, nope. sometimes we need to kick this one as well so we can actually run the trigger just like we did the test on the uh, the Power Automate side of things. And we can see there's our workflow that's running right now. And I can open that up. So the first thing you'll notice is this interface here, the, the green check marks, you know, the, the debugging as we go through the steps, exactly the same as what we saw in Power Automate because they're actually the same platform under the hood. Microsoft built it once and, and Power Automate is actually built on top of Logic Apps. So what this does is it triggers when there's a new item in that list, just like the other one we were looking at. In this case, this is a request for a new site um, and we need to check and see if the, the site already exists. No, um, we actually look up in the divisions list to figure out who the approver is for that. So remember I picked the, the temporary demo with approvers. So that particular division does have an approver baked into it. So when we come to this check, if there's an approver, it's actually sent out an approval email. So let's have a look over here. And here's the approval email that came for that site that we just requested. This is also an actionable message, just like what we saw in Flow, but I don't have the same level of control. I can't capture comments in here. I can't put body in. It's a fairly simple approval email. And I'll show you in the last customer scenario how we expand on that, but let's go ahead and just approve this. It has the same action where it, it morphs the email so that I know that I've done the approval step on it. So that's nice from that point of view. And if I come back to the Logic App Run, uh, we can see here, hey, it's, it's gone through the approval and it's actually calling out to Azure Automation, which is a place for us to run PowerShell scripts up in the cloud that can actually drive the, uh, the creation of the site, of the Microsoft team, setting up the tabs and teams, doing all that kind of heavy lifting as part of that. It takes about a minute for the communication run to go through as part of that. While we're waiting for that, let's actually just come back here. And let's actually edit uh, this particular workflow. We're not going to save any changes, but I want to give you a sense of how easy it is to, to do things in here. So let's say right at the beginning of the process, after it's been triggered that a new item has been created, I want to send an email or, or do something um, before we even get into the, the guts of the, the workflow here. So you can see as I hover my mouse over here, I get a little plus sign there, I can click that and I can add an action or I can even add a parallel branch through the workflow. And this is where we start to see all of the connectors. So if, if I choose something like Azure Automation, you know, I can do different things to, to call out, but let's say we want to do something in Salesforce. It's a topic we're going to touch on very soon. Whoops, let me do that at this level here. So I can do all sorts of things against Salesforce. I can update records, I can uh, create new records, I can trigger off of things happening in Salesforce. Now these are all, there's no differentiation of, of you know, whether I'm going to be a standard or an enterprise plan in Logic Apps, I just pay for consumption. If I did this on the Power Automate side, I'd see a big premium tag beside this because calling it to Salesforce is a premium feature in Power Automate that I need the additional licensing for. So this is an advantage on the Logic App side, you know, depending on the, the volume of what you're going to be running, you only pay for use rather than paying for that full licensing from that point of view.
if I want to do something in Outlook, for example, you know, I can choose Office 365 Outlook. There's all sorts of things I can do in here. I come down here, I want to send an email, you know, and I can specify my body, my subject, and I can actually pull in details from the previous steps in here. So let's say in here, I want to grab the, uh, the title of the site that was requested. So I can actually paste that in and I can put my own free text in and, and grab the site URL. So you can actually build out a fairly complex body, subject, two line, all dynamically based on the parameters that are running within the flow. And this is how we build out uh, the workflows through here. So I'm not gonna save that. I'm gonna go ahead and discard that. Before I do though, I just wanna flip across. Uh, Power Automate doesn't have this, but on the Logic App side, as well as the designer view, it has this code view side to it as well. A little hard to understand. This is a JSON structure that explains how that workflow was built. The nice thing is that we can take this, we can put it into our source control, we can have a sort of a record of all the changes, we can see the, the discrete changes that were done through that workflow. Um, it's very nice to see from that point of view. I'm just going to go ahead and discard that though. So let's come back over here. So that's now succeeded. So if we look at our, our results for that, we see that it, it came through the approval step, it created the site, and then it sent out some, uh, some final emails to say, hey, the site was successfully created. So if I look back in my mail here, this is that final email saying, hey, that site has been approved and created. I need to tweak that email body a bit because it doesn't actually send it as a, as a hyperlink. Let me just copy that, paste that into a new browser tab. Give it a sec. And presto, there's our new communication site. Now, nothing's customized on this one here, but we could apply a template to say, hey, we want specific libraries and web parts and you know, really morph out what we want this site to look like as part of that. We didn't create a Microsoft team as part of it, but if we'd chosen a, a modern team site, we'd have the option to attach a team to that as well. So we can get quite sophisticated with OneNote integration, with Planner integration as part of that as well. Let's actually switch back to our deck um, and talk about how we did it for this particular consulting company. So, so they actually modeled after how we, we organize our own Microsoft Teams at Envision IT and Extranet User Manager, where what we do is we create a team for each client that we work with, and we create a channel within a team um, for each project. And if you're not familiar with Teams, this, this concept of Teams and channels is sort of a core concept within Teams. So in their scenario, um, let me just do some highlighting here. They actually start with, sorry, there we go, with Salesforce as their trigger. So rather than somebody filling in a form, uh, the, the process actually happened by a new opportunity getting recorded in Salesforce. And that's actually a trigger for our Azure Logic Apps. And the first thing we need to do is say, hey, do they already have a client team? Like, is this a new opportunity for an existing client or is it a brand new client? If it's an existing client, uh, we're just gonna create a folder in that client team site to, to put all the sales documents into. And we're gonna update back into CRM to say, hey, this is the spot where all the sales documents should go. Now, if they don't have a client team, we don't actually want to create one at this point yet because it's a, it's a new opportunity. We haven't closed it. We don't know if we're going to close it. Um, so let's just create a folder in the general team site, but still update CRM with that new folder uh, so we know where to keep those documents from that point of view. And then the next step is, well, if we come along and we actually close that opportunity. So again, that's a trigger in Salesforce saying, hey, this opportunity was actually won. It's become a real project for us. Again, that tr triggers Azure Logic Apps. And we do the same check. Do we already have a client team for that? Now, if we don't, we come down this path here, we're actually gonna go through the whole provisioning process. So the same thing I showed you in, in what I was just live demonstrating in our demo tenant, we're gonna create the Office 65 group, the Microsoft team, the SharePoint site will all happen as part of that. The OneNote, the planner potentially can come in as part of that as well. And we're gonna create a channel automatically in the team for this project related to the, the opportunity that was closed in Salesforce. There's a certain set of project folders that they like to see in all of their projects. So we're gonna create those. And then we're gonna take those sales documents that were in either somewhere in that client team or maybe they were in that generic sales area. We're gonna pull them back into this uh, project folder structure so that we have all the sales documents together with the project documents. We're gonna tell um, Salesforce, hey, we've now moved those to a new spot. And there's other systems that they use as part of their process from a project management point of view, we can actually link out to those and do updates as part of that as well. 
So you can see we've taken a, you know, a base open source Teams provisioning solution that we've had, and we've really extended it to say, well, let's have that trigger off of things happening in Salesforce and make it part of your sales process that touches not just the Office 365 bits here, but actually goes out into their other systems as part of that as well. So that was scenario two. Um, last scenario, scenario three, uh, this is an engineering extranet scenario. So we've got a, a, an engineering manufacturing company that needs to send out for review and approval drawings of things that they're gonna build and ship to their customers. And, and in their case, they use SAP. So all their sales orders are managed through SAP. And they actually have a, a drawing package program that programmatically generates those zip packages that have all the various different 2D and 3D drawings that they need as part of that sales order. In the past, that would email them out. If they really wanted to get away from email. Two challenges. One is email is not a great way to manage that. Second is these CAD drawings can get very big. They often they don't get through successfully from an email point of view. Uh, so what they're, they're moving to now is to actually deposit those zip packages into a SharePoint library, and that's the trigger for our workflow. So we can extract those documents, um, figure out who the customer is, send out the, the various different approvals, collect the responses for that, and then update SAP at the end of the process, which will then release the sales order to manufacturing. Um, so we're actually touching a lot of different systems. We've got a custom connector that we've created for our external user manager product for those external client contacts. We've got SAP integrations going on here. We've got Azure Automation, um, and, and there's a lot of moving pieces. So we decided, you know, what we're going to build this as an Azure Logic Apps. So apologies on this diagram. It's a little complicated, but let me walk you through it, and it actually makes more sense as, as I explain as we go through so you got to remember the process starts in SAP, creating this drawing package and dropping it into a, a SharePoint library. So that's the start here. That's the trigger to the workflow. Now, one of the things that that program does is it actually creates what's called a JSON file, basically a program file that has all the job order information that we need. Who's the customer? Who are the contacts of the customer? Um, who's the, uh, the sales engineer on the internal side of things? Who's the account manager? all that kind of details are, are in that JSON file that they create through their SAP process. Now, it's very much like the previous example, though. Um, we have to determine, hey, is this a new customer or an existing customer? So if it's if it's not an existing customer, we actually have to go through and, and create a customer folder where we're going to put this stuff. And we create what's called an extranet user manager group. It's a place to put contacts from the customer into so that they can have access to review the drawings. And then we're going to assign permissions to that group into that folder that we just created back here. And we're going to create a document set for the sales order documents. Um, you know, and, and if that customer folder already existed, we'll, we'll create it in the existing one. We'll create the customer folder, set up the permissions, and, and upload all the documents. So the documents that started back here end up in the folder over here with the permissions already assigned to the customer and everything's ready to go from that point of view. Now, we may not actually have all the right customer contacts yet. You know, the SAP might have assigned a new customer contact to this job. So we need to update who the people are in that group, populate that group, and then decide what approval process it needs to go through from there. Uh, so the first is, you know, internally, does it need to go to a technical sales engineer um, at the, the manufacturing company for their approvals before it goes out to the customer? So if it's not, then just go ahead and update it and send a, a customer digest to the customer. If it does, we're going to do an approval step and wait for the TSC to sign off before we send it out to the customer. Then some, some customers or some jobs may not need a customer approval. Um, but if there is customer approval required, we're going to come down this path here and trigger the customer approval. Now, the key part here, um, if you remember the approvals that I was showing you in the first two scenarios, one came from Power Automate, the other one came from Azure Logic Apps. They were both what were called um, actionable, Outlook actionable messages. Now here, they wanted to do the same thing. Actually, if I go to the next slide, um, this is an example of the Outlook actionable message that we wanted to send out. Now, remember I said we couldn't customize the one that came through Logic Apps, but what we can do is, is leverage the underlying technology that Logic Apps and Power Atom are, are using, which is called adaptive cards. It's a way to build these actionable messages in a number of different ways, either for Outlook, for Teams, for conversation bots, and, uh, and there's a number of ways that that can be structured through as part of that. So what we've got is this actionable message. We come back to our, um, our workflow here. It's going to send that actionable message out. And the key is that we wanted to make sure that it came from the, the 
the vendor's email address. So if you remember the emails that came in the previous steps, they actually came from Microsoft. We didn't want that. We wanted it to come from the actual vendor to their customer. So there's that connection. We wanted it branded to them and really structure things through nicely from that point of view. Uh, so we send that actual message out. We wait for their approval. We can send reminders. They have a three-day time period that they need to get approval back in before it impacts their uh, their shop floor manufacturing schedule. So as long as it comes in through that, if the customer approved, we're good to go, and we can update SAP from there. So a nice number of steps that uh, that can go through as part of that. Sorry, I just need to tweak one thing here. So in, in the adaptive cards, now I'm not going to get into it this session, but it can get fairly technical again from a security point of view. Um, we kept it pretty simple in this scenario. Basically, we put what's called a GUID, a really long set of letters and numbers that hard, that's hard to guess in the approval link so that it's difficult to guess. And, and that means anybody who gets that approval email, even if they forward it to somebody else, that somebody else can approve it. That was actually desired in, in this scenario. They're okay with that. You, you might send it to customer contact A and they forward it to contact B that you didn't know about. Contact B uh, approves it. That's actually fine from their business process point of view. But if we wanna go uh, more secure than that, then we have to start putting certificates in the, the card so that we can confirm who the person is that clicked the approve on it and make sure it's part of the approver list and, and integrate all that in with Azure AD. So that gets a little more complex. So we'll leave that for another day. So that was our, our third and final scenario that I want to take you through. Um, so let's just talk about a couple of other uh, interesting topics around here. So uh, one thing that I touched on at the beginning is this idea of, of having different environments, having a development, a test, a production environment, for example, in the Communal Living Toronto example. So if I go back to their site here and let me come over to their Power Automate, we can see up here we've actually got the ability to have different environments in. Now they've only got the one set up in here. You can actually, if you've got a, a premium Power Automate, you can create multiple environments in here. In in concept, that's um, that's useful. The problem is that that only gives you multiple Power Automate environments. It doesn't give you multiple Office 365 environments. So we actually prefer to have separate Office 365, completely separate Power Automates uh, between all those different environments. Now, what that means is it gets a little difficult to move those from environment. How do you move it from development into test and into production? Basically, you have to do an export and an import. And that gets a little messy f fixing up the connections. You know, how does it connect to the Outlook or the SharePoint in production versus in development? You need to fix those. There's actually a GitHub solution from a, a Toronto SharePoint user group member, Dennis. Um, I actually haven't tried it myself. He took me through a, a quick um, demo of that, but it's quite neat. It basically takes the packages that you export and allows you to, to programmatically fix up those connections and then bring it into your new environment from there. It doesn't help the first time you move between environments, but once you've done that once, it greatly simplifies that process from there. Logic apps are, are much the same. You have to export it from one and import it into the other. It's a little bit different because we've got that JSON code view that I was showing you, uh, but we still have the same challenge around fixing up the connections. We're actually working with a, another fellow MVP around how to build some templates. They're called ARM templates, so you can deploy them easily into Azure through there. Uh, so we're hoping to have that baked together soon as part of our team's provisioning solution. So just something to think about. Um, you, you do want to have sandbox areas to play with as you're building this stuff, and then move that into a production environment from there. The next one I'm going to touch on, I haven't had a chance to play with it yet myself. It was something that was announced at Ignite back in the fall. It's called Power Automate Robotic Process Automation. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's, it's an interesting concept, though, and it's something that only exists on the Power Automate side. Basically, the challenge is if you're trying to interface with a system, but it doesn't have any sort of API programming interface that you can interact with to build your custom connector for, you're kind of stuck because there's there's no way then to automate that. And, and this is really an answer to that. So if the application you're trying to work with runs in a browser, uh, you basically interact with that browser application. You can record the steps that you go through. You can insert uh, program pieces as part of those steps. And you can basically build a macro that drives the browser to, to go through there. I'm actually quite interested in this one because one of the pieces that I love to make part of our provisioning solution is Microsoft Streams. 
The problem is that Microsoft hasn't published an API for streams. So we can't automate anything against it, but we could use this robotic process automation to actually drive the stream pages to do things like create a new channel in streams when a channel gets created in Teams and link those together and put the tab on Teams. You know, that would be awesome. Um, it's not something we can do through an API just yet. So we're actually looking to extend our, our provisioning solution to add that in as part of that. So there's a link here in here on the UI flows. It is still in preview, but it's available, so you can try it out and, and play with it. Um, looking to, to maybe do a future session on that one as well. Now I've mentioned custom connectors. Uh, the idea here is if you've got your own custom systems, like our Extranet User Manager product, it has an API that we've exposed for all the various different features of the product, and we've wrappered a, a standard custom connector around that so you can use that. We actually want to take the next step and actually publish that into the store for Power Automate so it becomes a standard connector that anybody can use. Uh, but basically, it's a wrapper around the API, the programming interface that allows you, your service to talk to, to Power Automate, Power Ops, and Logic Apps. And once you've built the connector once, it works the same across all three of those. You don't have to do it three times. Now, as I mentioned, there's a ton of out-of-the-box connectors. This slide's about a year and a, a bit old now. At that point in time, it was 200 cloud services. I'm not sure what the number is now, but it just keeps growing. And it doesn't have to be just cloud. You can actually get to your on-premises system. Let's say you've got a, you know, a SharePoint 2013, 2016, 2019, whatever um, on-premise, and you want to make that part of the, the workflows that you're building in the cloud. You can use what's called an on-premises data gateway to connect to those systems. So your workflow running in the cloud can actually reach into on-premises system and work with that. Now, bear in mind in, in the Power Automate scenario and the Power Apps, using that on-premises data gateway is an enterprise feature, so you'd need the additional licensing for that, uh, but that's absolutely able to do. And you can also do it from a Logics app point of view. Um, you can wire up your own security as part of that, and you can really, you know, wrapper your own line of business applications or third-party applications as part of that. So if you're thinking about building a connector, um, you know, if you're an enterprise developer, maybe you want to wrapper your own services that you have. Maybe you've got an enterprise service bus that you want to build this around. Um, or maybe you're a, an independent software vendor like we are. We have a product, Extranet User Manager, and you want to make it easier for people to interact with that as part of that. So we're getting close to the top of the hour. I just want to do a couple of wrap up points here. Uh, the next one I mentioned, there was some future topics that I was interested in getting some feedback on. So I'm gonna open up a poll in a second, but let me just explain uh, the different topics that we have here. So the Community Living Toronto, the first customer scenario that we took you through, that idea of having some simple security in there with the user folders and the user information, using Microsoft Forms, which is a really simple way to build forms and wiring that into Flow using all the standard Office 55 licensing, I see a lot of value in that scenario. So maybe doing a, a deeper dive into that topic, maybe even open source some of that out from a GitHub point of view and do that as a specific topic. I mentioned the, the Power Automate robotic process automation, so that ability to drive pages, You know, maybe doing a, a streams example of that, of, of automating streams and showing what that looks like. Again, we could open source the results of that into our team's provisioning, so you can actually get your hands on the bits and try it out yourself. Um, for those of you that want to get more technical, I know I got pretty techy at points through here, but if you want to go deeper than that even into you know, the details of, of building out the flow, of building out the logic apps, you know, the specifics of how you migrate it from environment to environment, um, looking at maybe doing a deeper technical dive, maybe a white paper that goes along with as part of that. Um, sorry, I duplicated the, the last two. There were supposed to be two different ones. One is the, the business case around the team's provisioning that I showed you, and the other is doing a, a technical deep dive into that one, which covers not just the workflows, but also the Azure automation um, and, and logic app side of things through that. So let me open this poll up now that I've given you a, a good sense of which each of these topics are. And I'd love to get your feedback, and that'll help me guide uh, what things I'm going to talk about next from a future webinar point of view. So we've got just over half the people in there. I'd really appreciate feedback on this because you know it's a lot of work to put these sessions together. I love doing them, uh, but I want to make sure that I'm hitting the mark in terms of what people are looking for from there. So we're at about 75% there now. I'll leave it open for another uh, 20, 20, 30 seconds. We'll leave it at a minute um, and see how many people we can capture as part of that.
Okay, we're just coming up on the top. We're about 90% there. Let me just close that out. And let me share that back out. Um, so pretty even spread across a number of them. So the, the employee self-serve being the top one there, uh, not surprising. I'm actually pretty interested in that one, particularly if I can get some, uh, some open source bits together as part of that. I think there's a, a lot of power there for people to be able to build a base solution and then allow power users to build on from that point of view. About half from the Power Automate side of things. Um, actually, the, the must be a technical audience. So 70% saying, hey, let's get deep on the, the technical side, flow and logic apps. I think I'd probably combine a bit of both into those. And certainly the deployment process from a software development lifecycle, what does that look like? Uh, teams provisioning best business case, I guess a little less on the uh, uh, the non-technical audience side here, but certainly on the team's provisioning implementation side, I'm actually working on a white paper right now that walks through the steps to implement that open source solution. I have a previous version from the, the last version of that um, that open source, but it really needs a fair bit of updating. So we're, we're just collecting that from a number of people that are going through that process. We should have that out in the next week or so from that point of view. So um, keep, keep posted. Actually, let me just share what we do have going on from a, a a future point of view that's already booked from an upcoming events. I mean, obviously there's today's session there. Uh, we've got the Modern Workplace Summit. I'm gonna be down in Philadelphia the second week in April. So if you're in the area down there, um, I'm gonna be talking about the whole team's provisioning side of things, as well as structured and unstructured extranets. I'm doing that same talk uh, the, the third week in April in Chicago at Microsoft Ignite. So if you're in the area there, by all means come by. Um, we're going to be doing a booth down at SharePoint Conference Las Vegas in May, um, also a booth in Europe in Wiesbaden for the European Collaboration Summit. Um, and then they haven't opened booths yet, but we're planning on having a booth at the Big Ignite in New Orleans, new location this year. It's going to be later in September. So a lot of things coming on. Uh, but what I would like to do is interleave a couple of webinars through the April, May, June timeframe. So I'll absolutely use the feedback. Thank you, everybody, for providing that um, in terms of how to prioritize and, and structure which topics we're going to be doing from that point of view. Um, almost out of time here. Uh, a couple of links, kind of a scary looking page, but it's good to, uh, to grab later. As I mentioned, we'll put a PDF copy of this up on our site. So you'll have all the links through there. Um, I haven't been watching the questions that we've been going through. Uh, Logan and staff are usually watching that, doing their best to, to answer from that point of view. I know we've only got about three minutes left, but Logan, is there anything that we want to cover off from a questions live while we still have the session going? Awesome. Well, with that, uh, two minutes to spare. I'll give you a couple minutes back. Uh, appreciate everybody taking the time. I hope that was useful and look forward to having you join us from future webinar point of view. Have a great rest of your day.